Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Winston Churchill's Richard Carvel, starring Douglas Fairbanks Jr. on the Hallmark Playhouse. Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. Jane Tilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we dramatize a fine adventure story, the author of which bears an honored name indeed. Winston Churchill. But this Mr. Churchill was an American born in Missouri some 80 years ago, and certainly one of the most celebrated and popular of America's historical novelists. The story of his we've chosen for tonight is Richard Carvel, and the period is that of the American Revolution. Perhaps the brave days of old seem never so brave as they do today amidst the tensions of our own worldwide problems. And for this reason, I think you'll enjoy Richard Carvel as an excitingly imagined episode in the great story of America. And now, a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss, before we begin the first act of Richard Carvel, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Hallmark Cards have a magic carpet quality about them. They take you visiting, however great the distance, to help celebrate a birthday, an anniversary, a holiday, or just any day when you're thinking of someone. There is a quality about Hallmark Cards that whispers good taste. And you'll send them with pride, for that identifying hallmark on the back adds meaning. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Winston Churchill's Richard Carvel, starring Douglas Fairbanks. The war of the revolution was at its height in 1778 when the ill-fitted American frigate Bonhomme Richard sighted the British man-of-war Serapis with her great batteries of guns and a mighty cheer burst from the ragged crew of the Bonhomme Richard. Who were they to fight the bone and sinew of the king's navy and a creaking ship of an age gone by? And who was this Captain John Paul Jones standing so straight on the quarterdeck to inspire his men with love and worship and fervor to blind them to such odds? But the bosuns piped and sang out the command, the drums beat the long roll, and the fifes whistled their courage. And at his station in command of a battery of guns stood Lieutenant Richard Carvel. And as often happens at a moment of stress, into his mind came thoughts of hope. There are times coming when every man must choose a side and stand arrayed in his own colors. It is not for me to shape your way of thinking. Decide in your own mind that which is right. And when you've decided, know then that God is with you. And swerve not from thy course even the width of your sword for any man. Yes, decide your course. General Washington uttered those words and I've never forgotten them. How well I recall that afternoon when I was confronted by my grandfather, whom I adored, and my uncle Grafton, whom I detested. Richard, it has come to my knowledge that last night you fought a duel with Lord Comyn, a man who has been your friend. Is this the truth? Yes, grandfather. I am told that you had the opportunity to kill him, but instead chose to be wounded yourself. That is true, sir. Richard, committed treason against his majesty the king. By your rashness, you brought ridicule and reproach from the family whose loyalty has hitherto been unstained. I believe, Uncle Grafton, that I'm as able as any man to care for the Carvel honor. Well, you attacked Lord Cohen because he stated that the hotheads and the rebels here in the colony should be stamped out because they were traitors to His Majesty the King. Now, deny that if you will. I do. Ah, hey there, Grafton. I told you Richard was loyal to the Crown. Hmm. One moment, sir. I took exception to that remark made by a visitor who didn't have the courage to back his insulting words with a sword. Lord Coman, from shame, defended his countrymen. Richard! I've never deceived you, Grandfather, and will not now hide from you that I believe the colonies, loyal as they are, 
to have a just cause against His Majesty and the Parliament. But, but we are all English. We came from England. You were born there, Richard. I'm aware of that, sir. I have great love and affection for the mother country, but I believe in freedom for America, too. A carvel against the king? The carvels ever did what they believed right, sir. You would not have me go against my conscience. Soon after, the governor decreed that any act of disloyalty would be met with a penalty of death. But my tongue and the tongue of other patriots would not be stilled. This and my Uncle Grafton, who resented me as heir apparent of my grandfather, were the dark shadows of my life. As for the light, there was Dolly Manners, who could be willful and cruel, laughing and forgiving, shy or impudent, in a breath. She was as beautiful as a rose that blooms in the night. I loved her deeply. But she was a will-o'-the-wisp, and I could never feel sure she returned my affection. We saw each other again at a party given in her honor. Tonight, Richard, I'm in a holiday humor. You sound reckless rather than merry. Are you not happy? What a silly question. Why do you ask? Because somehow I believe you're not, Dolly. You and I are here together. Could I wish for more? I'm as happy as you. That may well be, for I might be happier. I believe this is my dance. Oh, let's not dance. Remember when we were children, the place I used to play fairy godmother and wind flowers into my hair. What need to ask? Come, into the garden. As Milady commands. Would you miss me if I went away, Richard? What do you mean? Just that. I'd miss you terribly. Papa has decided that we sail next week for home. Home? England? I'm going to make my bow to royalty. Oh. Your Majesty, this is Miss Manners of the province of Maryland. You're... You're really glad to go, aren't you? And why not? I shall see the world and meet people of consequence. So you're going to England to meet people of consequence. Well, don't you believe there are people here in the colonies who amount to anything? Haven't you ever heard of Benjamin Franklin, or Patrick Henry, or Mr. Adams, or Colonel Washington, or... <laughs> Mr. Oh, how provincial you are, Richard. And I thought perhaps I counted in your life. Oh, but you do. You're the first person I've told. You should feel honored, sir. You'll write me, won't you? Yes. But first I'll have to become a man of consequence. Oh, Richard, you silly goose. I dote upon seeing you in a temper. I'll stir the flame a bit more by telling you Jack Coleman is returning to England. And on the same boat. Dolly, don't leave. Oh, so you are jealous. No, I mean... Uh, well, just what do you mean, Richard? It, well, it'd be too presumptuous to ask you... Uh, oh, how, how can I hope that you would... Oh, you've always said you'd marry an earl, Dolly. I believe you will. Indeed. Well, at least in England there are so many earls to choose from. Gallant men, all filled with smooth compliments, smooth manners. Not anything like you. I... I see. Do you? You're big and honest and clumsy and... And what, Dolly? Oh, and stupid. But I'll miss you more than anyone else I know. Now take me back, sir. My lady left for England, and as the months flew by, not once did she deign to write me. And I didn't write. I tried and failed. And then I tried to forget. The Second Virginia Convention of Delegates was to be in session March 23rd, 1775. It was to be the prelude to the life story of our country, and I was to be a delegate. But I never arrived. Somewhere along the route, I was felled from behind with a mighty blow of a sword. I came to my wits to find myself aboard a filthy slave ship, and before me stood a grotesque figure of a man, Captain Griggs. <laughs> so you're risen from the dead, my fine bucko. Why, why was I brought here? Sir? Your uncle, Grafton Carvel, paid me money to kill you. Oh. And I'd be paid more when he inherits the old bucko's fortune. <laughs> yes, it's a fine deal I made. I've got you and the money to boot. But hark here. I'll stand by half my bargain. But if you ever reach Maryland alive, may they hang me to a yard arm. Oh, what, what's our destination? Wherever there's bounty. We fly the black flag with skull and crossbones and by the ghost. 
You'll earn your keep here. From sunup to long past sundown, I worked aboard the foul vessel. Indeed, I earned my keep. Soon I was made aware that when we arrived in the West Indies, I was to be sold as a plantation slave. Then, suddenly, an incident happened to drive all else out of my mind. A schooner was coming upon us, and her guns commenced firing, striking us broadside. When later I was fished out of the water and brought aboard the schooner, Ruth, I was met by its captain, Captain John Paul Jones, the wonderful Scotsman. No, by St. Andrew. Are you Kelpie or pirate? Neither, Captain, but a young gentleman in misfortune. Which? <laughs> it's Duff Yard. Uh, your servant, Mr. Uh... Richard Carville of Carville Hall in His Majesty's province of Maryland. Your very humble servant, Mr. Carville. It is in faith a privilege to serve a gentleman. Captain, you are sailing eastward? Yes, yes. There is no chance of you touching in the colonies? No. Well, is your destination Scotland? No. I've renounced my country forevermore. May God forgive me for I love the land dearly. You renounced your country? May I ask why? Of course. Some of my countrymen who should be my oldest and best friends are become my enemies. They've robbed me of my good name and my honor, and they're not yet content, so they robbed me of my country, which I hold dearer than all. Who well, I'm not permitted to return by law. I seek a home, and I shall find one. Oh, what of America, Captain? It's a land of opportunities. Why, any man with imagination and courage would be willing to fight for her. There's no limit how far he can go. I say give it a try, Captain. Nope. Oh. My mind is elsewhere. My grandfather is rich and, and not lacking in gratitude. You, sir, whose bravery and charity will have restored me to him, shall not want for friends or money. Mr. Carwell, a reward is a thing that should not be spoken of between gentlemen. I'm sorry. My home will be in London. That's there I plan to become a gentleman. Become? Aye, but I'm the son of a poor gardener. I fear you little know the value of what you represent. There's no advantage in the world to equal that of your fine gentleman. Surely you can't mean that. But I do, sir. Mark well when I say that my time will come, and a day when the best of them will bow to me. And that triumph shall be mine. Aye, every inch, for incentives the most of the battle. was more wisdom in this man than I dreamed of then. Here lay hid the very keynote of that ambitious character. He stooped to nothing less than greatness for a triumph for, over his slanderers. During the months, the following months, I learned to know him well. When finally Captain John Paul Jones had discharged all his cargo, he headed his schooner toward England and London, the place he had chosen to make his home. And where Dolly Manners held my heart ever so lightly in her hand. We'll return to the second act of Richard Carvel, starring Douglas Fairbanks. When you stop to think about it, a greeting card is a pretty wonderful thing, for it can carry your very thoughts, your feelings to others better than you might be able to express them yourself. You know, the unusual fact about a greeting card is that you never buy it for yourself. You always buy it to send to someone else. This is why the makers of Hallmark cards consider the words on every greeting card so very important. They are aware there is no magic like the magic of words to reach the hearts of others. What power words have to deepen the affection of those you care for, to heighten their happiness on festive occasions, to comfort them in sorrow, to strengthen ties of friendship. And what power words have to make new friends. For every person, for every occasion, you'll find Hallmark cards to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And every Hallmark card will speak also of your own good taste by its perfection in every detail of color and design and craftsmanship. That's why I'm sure if you were to ask any group of friends what name they think of in greeting cards when they want to send the very best, they'll quickly answer Hallmark cards. So it's easy to remember, it would be difficult to forget, to look for that Hallmark on the back of every card you choose because you care enough to send the very best. 
Now back to James Hilton and the second act of Richard Carvel, starring Douglas Fairbanks. <laughs> Twilight had deepened as the men of the Bonhomme Richard waited fearlessly for the British man of war Serapis to come within gun range. There was no sound except from time to time a muttered command. And as the Serapis came closer and closer, the tension mounted, for soon Captain John Paul Jones would give the order to begin the action. At his gun post, Lieutenant Richard Carvel stared into the darkness, but his mind was still in the past. I know of no feeling of awe to equal that of a stranger approaching for the first time a huge city. Yes, here was London, great and pitiless. And for the three weeks we had been there, the fear of it was still upon our souls. Upon two points I was worried. Captain John Paul Jones's desire to meet persons of birth was near a mania with him, and I'd not the courage to dampen his spirits. The other... John Paul and I were faced with the prospect of a debtor prison because we could not pay our landlord. It was Lord Coleman who came to our rescue. Jack! Jack Coleman! Richard Carvel, what are you doing in this hole of a room? <laughs> Money, your lordship, or the lack of it. <laughs> <laughs> How much you owe, Richard? Uh, 23 guineas, counting debts, board, and interest. <laughs> oh, very well, it should be taken care of. <laughs> now, pack up, we'll out of this curse at home. I've nothing to pack. <laughs> but before we go a step... You must know the man, but for whose bravery I would not be here now. My Lord Coleman, this is Captain John Paul Jones. Aye, sir. Well, you shall not lack reward for this, Captain, I promise you. What you've done for Mr. Carvel, you've done for me. Captain, I thank you. You shall have me interest. I, uh, I have sought no reward, my Lord. Hey, <laughs> Ged, I believe you, Captain. But you shall be rewarded, nevertheless. Be good enough, sir, to take this money and deliver it to the innkeeper, and we'll soon be on our way. Oh, one moment, if you please. Captain John Paul Jones is not a menial, an errand boy. Uh, never mind, Richard. I'll, I'll deliver the money, sir. You shouldn't have done that, Jack. You shouldn't have treated him in that manner. Oh, who the devil is this John Paul Jones? What's to become of him? Oh, you must give him 200 pounds or 1,000 if you like and let him get out. He can't be coming to the clubs with you. Well, you don't understand the man, Jack. What he has done for me is out of friendship. And he wouldn't touch a farthing save what I owe him. Oh, cursed if he isn't a rum sea captain. Cursed if I ever ran foul of one yet who would refuse a couple of hundred and call quits. <laughs> What's he to do? Is he to live like a lord of the treasury upon a master savings? Jack, I would willingly stay here in this hole of a room rather than desert him. And as soon as I can convince him that America is the place for him, we'll leave together. Oh, you must not leave England now. And why? <laughs> because Dolly Manners will marry Lord Chartersey if you do. Oh. Then take my word for it, you alone can save her from that. Oh, nonsense. Now, her father owes Chartersey a great deal of money, which he cannot pay. It's a question of honor with her. Well, what about you? You're in love with her. <laughs> now, had she refused me 50 times instead of only twice, <laughs> since she will not have me... I would rather it were you than any man alive, Richard. For she loves you as surely as the earth is turning. And now, will you go to Maryland and be a fool? If it were true that she loved me, I... I wanted to go to her. But I was a sorry figure, scarcely a man of consequence. I had to be important in her eyes, if no one else's. But at last, I, I put aside my pride, for I was, after all, a mere man very much in love. Richard, so you've finally come to see me. Dolly, Dolly. Thank God you're alive. Oh, Richard, we've been miserable since we had news of your disappearance. This is worth it all, Dolly. But you've been here for three weeks. Why didn't you come to me when you were in trouble? In truth, I, I hunted your house for a sight of you from the moment I set foot in London. For a sight of me? And had you not strength enough to lift a knocker, sir? Oh, come now, who is the lady? There's only one lady in my life. Oh. And where is your captain? I shall bring him here presently to meet you. I hear he is very fanciful. There are not many born like him, a poor gardener's son, who will rise by character and ability to be a captain before the age of 30. And he's a gentleman, I say, far above many I've known. And above all, he's a man. Oh, forgive me. 
Do you know why I came here today? Why? This isn't a game. We're, we're grown up now. I came here because I love you. I always have. Oh, Richard. Why did you ever tell me? Why couldn't we always remain friends? Had I only foreseen, I should never have let you speak. You must have seen these years I've loved you. Nor could I have hidden it if I'd wished. But I, I have little to offer you. I, no, I was a fool. Oh, Richard. Forgive me, Dolly, if you can. I, I didn't mean it. Nor do I presume to think you loved me. I, I have adored. I shall be content to adore you forever. And I came because... Because I might save you if a danger threatened. Danger? Yes, from Lord Chartersey, who has a hold on your father. You cannot love him. Oh, please, Richard. You cannot love oh, him. Oh, it's true. It's true. But what else is there for me to do? Surely if your father knew how you felt, he wouldn't permit it. He isn't that kind. No, Richard, no. We'll find a way, my darling. We will. I love you. And I love you. But darling, I... darling. Oh, my love, we must forget each other. If that is possible. How could I forget, Dolly? Unless heaven had robbed me of reason, had torn the past from me at a single stroke, I could not have forgotten. When I reached my lodgings, Captain Jones was waiting for me with an urgent message from Lord Crump. He asked that I come to his club as soon as possible. I did not have the courage to tell the captain that he was not welcome, so I invited him along. Richard, news has reached us that on July the 4th, 17 and 76, the colony signed a declaration of independence. You know what that means, of course? Yes. We're at war. Oh, hello. Oh, Richard, uh, this is Mr. Fox. We've met before. What the deuce is to be done with those unruly countrymen of yours, Mr. Carvel? Why can't they be pacified now that we've taken off all the tax except the tea, hmm? Well, you, for a gentleman of our party, must lead a very sorry life among them. Tell me, do they really mean to go as far as rebellion? It's not a question of tea, sir. It's, it's a question of principle, which means more to Englishmen than life itself. And we are, after all, Englishmen. Oh, I thought you came of a loyalist family, Mr. Carvel. King George has no more loyal servants than the Americans, Mr. Fox, be they Tory or Whig. And he has but to read our petitions to discover it. I... I beg your pardon? Richard. No. Say what you have to say to these gentlemen, Richard. Thank you, Captain Jones, sir. Do you know what you're doing to America? You're forcing home injustice and tyranny to the millions for the benefit of the thousands. For it is true, gentlemen, that the great masses of England are against the measures you impose on us. Their fight is our fight. We are fighting for the things you taught us to believe in. Taxation without representation is true of your great cities here as well as of our vast colonies. You are helping the king to crush freedom abroad in order that he may more easily break it at home. You are committing a crime. You call us rebels and accuse us of treachery. I tell you, we would give up all we own were the glory or honor of England at stake. If you wish money, leave the matter to our colonial assemblies and see how readily you'll get it. But instead, you've asked for war, so that you can continue to grind the spirits from a people who have in them the pride of your ancestors. Yes, and we will fight you to the last man. Come, let's leave, Captain Jones. Aye, you spoke your heart well, lad. I'm going to America with you. With the help of sympathetic persons, the captain and I were smuggled aboard a merchant boat, whose destination was on the other side of the Atlantic. As we crept into the darkness of the night, my heart was heavy for leaving England meant leaving Dolly. Must a man forever have to choose between two loves? But then quite clearly and simply, I knew in my heart's heart that Dolly would wait for me. That somewhere after the sounds of guns and shouting had died away, and the victory won, Dolly and I would be together. It couldn't be otherwise. Mr. Carvel, His Majesty's Seraphis is within range. 
Pass the word to begin the action, sir. Aye, aye, Captain. Commence firing. By the blasted scurvy. Don't I swear, Mr. Carbo. In another minute, we may all be in eternity. Our sails are gone. Our sides are torn through. The deck's on fire, and there isn't enough room or enough surgeons to take care of the wounded below. And the Serapis is preparing to ram us, Captain. Every man to his post there. Captain Jones, this is the commander of the Serapis. Are you prepared to surrender, sir? Sir, I have not yet begun to fight. What are we waiting for, men? Serve the cannon double-headed, my lads. For every shot brings us that much closer to freedom. One... the Bonhomme Richard was part of the courage that made America the great land it is today. They fought against tremendous odds and they won. The country they fought for and the country they fought against stand now together to guard the heritage of freedom. Let us guard it well. James Hilton will return in a moment. When I was downtown today, I was surprised to see so many people busy making their Easter card selections. So I decided I'd better mention the subject tonight. I'm sure you'll want to shop early, too. When you see the wonderful Hallmark Easter cards there are this year. All the loveliest flowers of springtime bloom on Hallmark cards. Crisp tulips, lilacs, sunny daffodils, delicate apple blossoms, violets, all glowing with color as fresh as if you just brought them in from the garden. You'll find cards that share the deep spiritual joy of Eastertide. You'll find cards for children as light-hearted as their laughter. You'll find just the perfect card for each friend, each loved one, to add the joy of your remembrance to their Easter day. To say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. I'm sure people have started earlier than ever this year to buy their Easter cards, so do stop in tomorrow at the friendly store where you'll find Hallmark cards, while you have your choice of all the wonderful Hallmark Easter cards. For this day especially, you'll want that hallmark on the back of every card you choose to say you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. You brought adventure into our lives tonight, Douglas Fairbanks. Our thanks to you for making a stirring period of history so real to us. Well, it was very real to me too, Mr. Hilton. But that seems to be characteristic of the stories you choose for Hallmark Playhouse. They have, uh, um, well, you might call it sincerity. You couldn't say anything we'd rather hear. And that's what I like about Hallmark cards, that same sincerity. They say what people really feel. By the way, the Motion Picture Academy Awards presentation starts in a half hour's time. I, I understand you're distributing the writing awards. Yes, and it should be a very exciting occasion. I must say I'm glad it's just across the street from here, aren't you? But before we hurry over, I want to tell you what we're doing on our playhouse next week. We shall present a true story called Pioneer Preacher by Opal Lee Berryman. She's written about her father and the exciting part he and his family played in helping to settle the West. Our star will be Charles Bickford. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music tonight was composed by Frederick Steiner and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Jack Rubin. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Mr. Fairbanks will soon be seen starring in State Secret. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Charles Bickford in Opal Lee Berryman's Pioneer Preacher. And the week following, Anne Blythe and Margaret E. Sangster's The Arbutus Bonnet. And the week after that, James Hilton's Appassionata on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is...
is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri.